Welcome to Bosses with Baggage. I'm Sherry Sutton, your host and business growth guide. Around here, we believe that failures are our superpowers. So in this podcast, we'll explore the many ways that setbacks can mold, shape, and change your life and your business and ensure that you come out of the fire better than before. Through interviews with business leaders and discussions of my own personal struggles, we'll unlock the secrets to turning setbacks and low moments into opportunities to thrive. From approaching your business with a servant's heart to getting comfortable with being the face of your brand, each episode will be a safe, judgment-free zone to reframe the concept of failure with honesty, empathy, grace, and a whole lot of laughter. So are you ready? Let's go. Hey, friends. I am so excited to be here today with Lauren. Say hey, Lauren. Hey. Thanks so for Lauren me. Howman is a sobriety coach. She is a um, incredible, incredible person. She's been a weight loss coach. Um, I am actually her marketing mentor. I am so honored to be able to do that with her. And so we've been working on helping her to grow her sobriety business, which is not why she's here today, but just thought I'd mention that um, because we have gotten to know each other really well. And I wanted to have her on the podcast because she's got an incredible story of that's just a great example of what we talk about here on Bosses with Baggage, which is like taking you know, a real dark night of the soul in your life and using it as inspiration to start a business that it is of service to other people, right? And we believe here at Bosses with Baggage that you can make money and be of service, right? There is no, you know, either or. And so she is a living example of how to do that. And so I wanted to have her on the show today. So Lauren, tell us a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit Um, Just a little quick introduction about who you are and what you do, and then we'll get into the baggage. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. What a lovely introduction. So thank you. And of course, yes, we do know each other well, and you've been really helpful so far with my marketing as my mentor. So thank you. Shout out to you. If you're thinking about it, of course, hit up Sherry. Um, And it's been really fun too. Everything doesn't have to be a drag, right? So yeah, I'm a mom of uh, four boys, age 24, 24, 10, and 7. I'm a wife. I'm a nurse practitioner. I'm also a Army veteran and um, entrepreneur. And like you said, I started off with, um, I was a nurse practitioner for a very long time. I'm still a nurse practitioner. I'm not working as such right now. Um, but I was really looking to get into something that would allow me to be home more. And so I started coaching health and wellness, and it really took off. I was also on my own health journey where I was taking off 80 pounds. People were seeing that, they were interested. So I took that opportunity to um, help other people do the same, helped over 1,200 people um, get similar results. Um, And during that time, I was able to transition home and work as a health coach only. And perfect timing because COVID hit and I was home with my kids who didn't have school and all the craziness was going on. Um, And I'd gotten sober right before I decided to come home. And guys, honestly, I never thought I would be in a space to be talking about I'm a sober coach. Seriously, what? (laughs) Because I never saw myself giving up alcohol. It was my bestie, right? It was the wine o'clock. It's time to pop that bottle. You know, I had the whole personality and persona that went with that wine mom. uh, But I hate the wine mom thing. Like, I just, it really, I did it too, right? Like, I, 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 you know, I get Facebook memories that come up and they're like, you know, wine mom culture. And it's all these like funny wine mom memes. Now I'm like, oh God, we were all like drunk driving our kids around or ignoring our kids while we were, you know, in the other, I just, I think it can be, I think it's lovely and fun for a lot of people, but for people like you and I, right. Obviously if you guys are new to the show and you don't know this, I'm in addiction recovery as well. Um, and yeah, like, if if you're somebody who can struggle with it, it can it can really be a way to say, oh well, but, but everybody else is doing it, right? And it's become such a popular part of culture. So, sorry, squirrel. Oh keep going. no, 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 no! Just <laughs> you know, you I'm know, on my soapbox. Yeah. Oh, I know. We can both get going on a good monologue, but cut me off whenever, man, because I'll just keep talking. So, um, or give me the sign, like wrap it up, girl. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, so um, I was I was in it and I never thought I would be able to give it up. I didn't want to for the longest. And then I started to really recognize that I was not a casual drinker and it really had gotten a hold of me and it was controlling my life. I was doing things that were a little bit uh, scary, potentially harmful um, to myself. You know, we get ourselves in situations when we're drinking that we are not being as mindful as we should. We might end up in a dark alley by ourselves because we're just, oh, you know, um, real life situations that I, you know, dangerous. And I knew that if I didn't quit, you know, I wasn't this person on a park bench with my paper bag and my bottle of my fifth handle or whatever. I was functional. I was going to work every day. I was showing up for my patients. I was coming home, but then I would do the work to make space for what I really wanted, which was to drink. And that sounds so horrible, but it's so true. And if people can talk about that, we can probably heal a little bit faster because if we can all raise our hands and say, I understand me too, instead of being like, Ooh, that's just you girl. That's not true. First of all, but we have all this stigma. And so coming home from work, you know, it would be, I'd gotten into a pattern of daily drinking and it was really a space where it was like, I can't do it all. I can't grow this business and drink at the same time. I can't raise my kids and drink at the same time because as soon as I start drinking, I stop caring about everything else. Um, and I just knew where I would land would be that park bench or more if I gave it another few years. So that's kind of my story of like, why did I get sober? Um, yeah. That, you know, we, we like, in in some of the recovery circles I'm in, we talk about it being the yets, right? And the more people who you meet who've gone through it, the more you're like, oh, well, that you know, you're like, you come in, you know, you start thinking like, oh, well, I that hasn't happened to me. I'm not the person under the bridge. But then you're like, yet, because then you see other stories of people, right? And that's one of the things we want to do on this podcast because you hear stories of other people who are like perfectly normal in every respect, except they ended up being that person under the bridge. And it happens super fast, faster than people realize. Very fast. And, you know, I didn't know, and maybe you can, you can um, resonate with this as well. It took me a while to figure out that I was actually in that space of it's time to do something. It's gone too far already. And I still had a job. I still had my family and still had my house. We don't have to wait until we are in that space. It's that typical scenario that Hollywood paints for us. If we wait that long, it's, it's harder to get back from. Um, and I didn't want to go there. I wanted to keep my family intact. And I had a very patient husband who I'm, I'm still shocked. He stuck through me with me through all of that. Um, but he wouldn't have, because it would have continued. This behavior does not ever just say like, oh, I think we're going to calm down for the next couple of years. It slowly gets worse and worse and worse. And we do more and more and more and we get more and more reckless. Um, and so when I quit that, that was my space where I was. Yeah. So how did you, you know, what was your process for quitting? Right. How, what resources did you use? How did you, you know, how did you kind of get through it? Because I know that journey is really what would have, I imagine, made you want to become a sobriety coach, right? Because you're like, oh, somebody was able to help me. And now I want to pass that gift on to other people, right? Right. So I already knew how to coach. I know how to talk to people. As a nurse practitioner, I talk to people all day long. As a wellness coach, I was talking to people all day long. So why not? Right. But um, the reason for it is because I did my sobriety in a way where I feel like it was I'm not going to say superior, but I came out happily sober instead of begrudgingly sober. So I'm not staring at someone with a glass of wine every day, just mad, you know, just mad because I can't have it and deprived and just in this space of woe is me and life sucks. And I want my best friend back, but I can't have her because I'm broken. Um, so as I was drinking, I knew for several years that I was problematic, but I wasn't ready to say it out loud and I wasn't ready to give it up. But I was doing like education on the back end. Every time I had a crap night or woke up feeling shame and guilt, I mean, if you're listening and you at all have done the alcohol thing a little too hard, we know what this is. Um, I would go and listen to anti alcohol messaging. And my big person back then was on YouTube. It was Craig Beck and he's the stop drinking expert. Most of his material is like very redundant now on Facebook or excuse me on YouTube. And, um, a lot of his content is paid. You have to pay to get to it. But back then it wasn't. And I didn't know about sober coaching. So I did it on my own kind of with the help of an expert who was in my ear 
all the time. Every time I was shameful, I was like, let's, let's listen to Craig. Cause everything he says is just like, it, it speaks to you. It's helping you break down, deprogram your brain against all the lies that society has told you about alcohol, the lies that you've told yourself and conditioned yourself so that you can continue your behavior, social media, big alcohol, all of that. When we break down the lies, suddenly it becomes not this elusive elixir that's you know magical filled with rainbows and unicorns. Um, it actually, we can take off the mask of that unicorn and see that it's like really that backstabbing best friend, like that frenemy. Um, and that's how initially I got started with that. And then when I had hit like my rock bottom where I was like, that's my threshold moment. I am done. I am sick of this. I'm sick of hurting other people with my words or my actions. Um, I am sick of feeling the way I do every morning and dragging and like doing like, I, I imagine it is like this army low crawl where you're just slithering across the ground. Like, Oh my God, please help me. I just got to get to work. And once I get some soda or some grease in me, I'll be fine. Um, I was sick of that life. And so when I quit, I'd had all this in me for like the last two years going. Um, and that made the decision really simple for me. And when I was truly done, of course, I tried to quit many, many times. When I was truly done, I was just done and I never looked back. And that was a little bit more than three and a half years ago. Yeah. 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 I had a similar experience where when I was done, I was done. Right. It's not as easy for a lot of people. And some people need, you know, even more, you know, even more resources. But, you know, who knows? I mean, I'm done for today. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, yeah. And I know and, that for me, it was really hard to say I'm done forever, Yeah, but I knew I was problematic enough to need to be done for at least like the time where I'm supposed to have a career at the time where I'm raising children. So I said, I'll start drinking again if I want to, when I'm 70 and that made it a little easier. It's like, Hey, we're just going to take a really long life break, but we can have it back when your responsibilities are pretty much gone if right. you want. And now looking back, I don't want it. When I'm 70, I'm not going to be drinking alcohol and being drunk all day. I'm going to be out wearing my grandma track suit, swishing as I walk the mall, right? With my two girlfriends. Yes. I'm going to uh, be the golden girls. <laughs> uh, mine is going to be a caftan. Oh, I love that. Like a yes. caftan with like, you know, arms full of, of, you know, big bracelets and a hat and you know, big glasses, a little like I am right now, even though I'm only 51. <laughs> just, just you plus 19 uh, years. That's all it is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I always wanted to be Blanche on the Golden Girls. Do you? Okay. So I am more of a Dorothy, a little grouchy, <laughs> a little not with the styles, a little bit not cute in those areas. Like the outfits that she wore were always these big, long flowies with the big, long pants. And they'd be like silver and gold and just kind of ridiculous. That's who I am. Right. I'm more of a Mrs. Roper. I love Mrs. Roper. Okay. Yes. If you remember, uh, uh, anybody who is like under the age of 45 will not understand any of these references, but that's okay. Yes. Look them up. Google them. Google Mrs. Roper and you'll be like, oh my God, I totally get yes. that. <laughs> and if you need really good, like... I just need to veg out TV. I've seen the Golden Girl episodes at least three times a piece in my 44 years. Yeah. It's really good mind numbing TV. Yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. So walk us through. So now you, so you have this successful wellness coaching business, right? Um, it, it's interesting that like that sort of when you hit your bottom from the addiction perspective. So what was like the intersection of those two? Do I have the timing right? Yes. So I quit drinking while I was growing this business. Once I quit drinking, and I'll, I'll rewind in a second here to tell you a little bit about how I tried to drink and be a wellness coach at the same time, which was really cute. Um, I don't mind saying that I had to cancel a few calls sometimes because I'd be like, oh, I had already started drinking and I forgot to take it a little slower or the conversations were taking longer. And now I'm trying to talk to my clients like this so that I don't slur, right? And I'm trying to pay attention like crazy. I'm taking notes while they're talking and they're just talking about their regular day because I'm not. Have you ever tried to read a book when you're buzzed? It does not work. No. So neither do conversations when you're supposed to be in a professional setting. I am the guide, the mentor, the coach. Um, but I was, I was already, 
um, done drinking by a couple of months. I came home. I'm still building my business because I actually left my NP career a little early because of circumstances that I wasn't liking at work. And so I came home a little premature, still needed to build. And I'm over here uh, able to build now because I'm no longer drinking. I had to stop the whole mental gymnastics of, okay, if I have five calls tonight, my calls were like 10 or 15 minutes a piece. I can open that first class, of the, the bottle of wine, have that first class while I'm on the third call, continue drinking on the fourth. And by the fifth, I can pour another. And as soon as I'm done, I can have the third glass and I'll be drunk like lickety split. And I know that's like the craziest, but if you've ever had to do any of that math, you feel me. Yeah. And- no, it's not crazy. I completely identify with that. Right. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people who have Um, like breathalyzers in their car. If you've ever had a DUI, you get something called a breathalyzer in your car. So you have to blow into it before your engine will start. And like people who have those, they, I love being in a room full of people who've had those because they will just go off on how like the math had to work. So I had to stop by 8.05 in order to be able to get in the car by 6.05 the next morning. And like, it's just, but that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You get to a space where you you don't want anything to interrupt your flow of drinking because it is the most important. So, for example, if you called me and said, hey, you want to go to the movies, but I'd already started my first drink? No, because that's all I care about now. If you want to come sit on my couch and watch TV with me and you're down with drinking, cool, we can do that. But if I've already had my first drink, the mental math goes on and on because um, my husband was an enabler to an extent, he was okay with me having like one bottle a night, right? So if I was going past that, it was like, come on, Lauren, what are you doing? You know, you have to work tomorrow. You know, you've got kids that may get up in the middle of the night, blah, blah, blah. And so I knew that my one bottle was like it for me every night. Now there were ways to get around it, which I did. But if you called me and wanted to go somewhere, I couldn't because I'm already working on my buzz and I I can't get that glass back out of me and put it back so I can have it later. Just insanity, absolute insanity. So, I used to um, say that I was only going to have one bottle of wine, but then I was like, well, but now I can have like an after dinner drink, right? right? Because like, this is just my, is it called an aperitif? Whatever it is that's like after, right? So I would have like sherry or, you know, some sort of like a dessert wine because it's not wine. This is just mm-hmm. like dessert alcohol. And mm-hmm. like that would then, and you know, by then you're, so buzzed you're not paying attention to how much you're drinking. <laughs> and isn't that just another lie that we tell ourselves? Like I deserve an after dinner drink. Like since when do you need an after dinner drink? Like alcohol doesn't help you digest your meal better. It doesn't do anything, but we make up these lies so that we can continue in patterns that aren't healthy. And, um, so yeah, I've been there too. <laughs> I've been <Yeah>. everywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So So that's a lot in one span of time, right? You're building a business, you leave a career, right? Which it's, you know, like that's stressful, whether you do it, you know, on a good note or on a not necessarily good note, and you're getting sober all at the same time. Right. I was very lucky. Number one, I knew I wanted to leave my, um, full-time career because I wanted to be home. I'd had a little taste of it and I really liked it. And that's what I wanted to do. And really having my eyes open to being able to earn money in a different outside of the box way from what I grew up with. You know, you go to high school, you graduate, you go to college, graduate. If you can go back and get a master's or a PhD, that's how my family sees the line of success going. And so to get outside of that box. um, So fast forward, yes, my business continued to grow because I was sober. um, But, oh, I'm sorry. See, there's that ADHD. Um, before I left my full-time career, I started paying my mortgage in advance, not just giving money to pay down the interest or the, the time, but to actually have like, I've paid January, I've paid February. So when I left my job, I had like 10, 11, 12 months of mortgages paid. Oh, so, so that I could, smart. Yeah. I, surprisingly so. The planning there was amazing. Um, so that gave me a cushion so I wasn't freaking out. And um, so then from there, you know, I'm sober for a couple months. I'm I'm doing this like from home thing. And instantly, it was like three months after I got sober that I was like, this has to come to the world. I have to bring this to the world. But I didn't know how um, because I I didn't have a sober coach. I leaned heavily on my sisters and my best friend that I could really tell all my BS to and share like how it's going with me not drinking. And those people could be proud of me, which I think was really beneficial. Um, But I wasn't talking about it anywhere else and nobody else really knew. 
because I was still embarrassed. I was still in that shame and guilt cycle of, well, I fixed it, but I, I'm still in a space where I think it's really bad and that I'm less than because of this problem that I had. So I was very quiet about it. And it took me about another year and a half to where I really felt discussions with my husband about what does it look like for me to come out with this and help others? Does it look bad on me? Am I going to be hindering myself in other places? Um, you know, professionally, will I still be hireable if I have this out on the internet and a million TikToks about how ridiculous my drinking was? And, you know, um, we had a lot of conversations and it took that long for me to really get on board with, I'm comfortable with it. I'm going to go and tell my story now on TikTok. Um, and then I started coaching as a contract um, coach for another um, sober coach, Chris Shattuck. And I learned all the ropes. I fell in love with it. And here we are. This is what I do. I offer private one-on-one -on -one coaching to clients. And I also am contracted with Chris to help him with his clients and his program as well. Yeah, that's cool. So how did you go from like, I'm going to share my story to becoming a coach? Like, did you seek out those opportunities? Did they kind of, did the universe make that decision for you? Like when you, when you decided to tell your story, because it's different, be, there's a difference between telling your story and like, I'm going to make a career out of this. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the universe did the whole Rubik's cube thing that I think of. It's like when, when somebody's got the Rubik's cube and they're just twisting and all of a sudden it just all matches. And you're like, whoa, how did that happen? The universe showed up for me really great there because um, when I contacted Chris, I found him on TikTok and my husband and I had already been talking about me being public about my story and potentially somehow figuring out how to serve others through this, not only through my story, but could I help them in a capacity as a coach? Um, and so I reached out to Chris and said, hey, I'm really interested in doing what you do. Our philosophies line up. Could you teach me? And he's like, sure. Um, I would just bring you on. This is how much it'll cost for me to mentor you. Yada, yada. And I was like, oh, it's a little steep. I don't, I don't know if I can do that right now because I wasn't really convinced that it was like for me in the moment. So I was like, I'll be back to it when I'm ready and then we'll get, you know, do this. Well, then as fate would have it, he started getting busy enough to where he needed to hire somebody. And so he reached out and he says, would you like to be a coach with me and I'll teach you as you go? And I'm like, that's the answer. And he's like, um, I'm like, I don't even care how much you're going to pay me because it's the opposite of paying you for the same education. And I don't want to recreate the wheel, right? Never. I want to work smarter, not harder. I don't want to have to like imagine all of this on my own, figure it out. I can, I'm smart enough, but why? Right. And so I came on, fell in love with it. And there you have it. it I transitioned into, um, I still do wellness, weight loss coming off medications. I do all the wellness stuff still. Um, and then I also do the sober coaching. Uh <laughs> We have a third guest right now. Oh, he left. Hi, Jim. <laughs> He's my 10 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> we'll be back. We'll be back. That was funny. Um, yeah, and now I, find, I just, I love, I just love when people find these stories inside themselves where they're like, this made such a big impact on my life. How can I use it to serve others? Right. And you know, you did that with the weight loss journey. Did you lose the weight before you sort of did the weight loss coaching or you kind of did it throughout, right? Like you were sharing your story first and then out of that became a coaching business, right? Right. So the, the weight loss was going on around the same time. Um, I'd lost like 50, 60, pounds. And then what was holding me back from losing the rest was honestly the alcohol. Cause I had figured out how to cut calories, but still have my alcohol. So when I quit drinking, I did gain a couple pounds initially because I like really hit the sugar hard, which is very common. But then I took those right back off. And then I was able to go further with my weight loss because I was not just pouring liquid sugar down my mouth every night. Um, so everything was kind of going on at the same time. Um, the, it's so interesting though, because I coach so many people through my program and everybody was having these great results. And I had this secret in the closet over here that like, I was this health coach who had lost all this weight. I was like this billboard, right. For my company. And then I'm secretly drinking myself to sleep every night to the point of like hangovers, blackouts, um, even on a weekday, sometimes I would get that far and still roll my ass out of bed. Excuse me. I don't know if we can cuss here. Um, we, we love cussing. Okay. <laughs> roll out of bed and get myself to work. Um, and so, you know, when you said the not yet, 
I totally feel you. Mine was, at least I don't blank. At least I don't drink and drive with my kids in the car. At least I don't drink when I'm responsible for my children alone. That one's partly BS anyway, but um, I thought I was being safe because like if husband was coming home at five, I could count on that. So at 430, I could get started, right? Again, that math of when I can start drinking, because by the time I get too drunk to take care of my children, if there was an emergency, like I needed to drive them to the ER, Kyle would be home and he could do it. Um, but there's 30 minutes there. And honestly, I can get two glasses of wine in, in 30 minutes. I was a pro. So 30 minutes, I'm already at a blood alcohol level that's way higher. So if anything had ever gone down, I would have had to make the decision and try to search in my brain, am I drunk? Am I buzzed? Can I drive? Um, I'm lucky I never had to face that decision, but I did other stupid stuff too. But I thought at least I don't. So this is okay. Yeah. Yeah. I totally, totally understand that math. And I think anybody who struggled with any kind of addiction, right? Whether it's shopping or you know, food or alcohol. It's that, you know, when, you, when you're spending that much time obsessing about it, there's something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and there's something that you need to be, you know, something that you need to look at. You know, one thing I wanted to spend a minute talking about is this idea of telling your story and then having it then lead to a place of being of service to other people. Because I think what happens is, Sometimes we do it the opposite way, right? Where we're like, we want to be of service to other people, but then we really struggle to tell their stories. And that's a lot of what I do in my coaching practice, right? Is like, hey, I want to be of service to these people. How do I, how do I show up? And I'm also often like, well, here's your story. You know, you need to tell your story. And there's a lot of just stuff that comes up with that, right? Like, and you know, um, you know, I just, I just recorded a Ted talk and hopefully by the time this comes out, it'll be, it'll be on TEDx on the YouTube channel, but it was, I, I already have a vulnerability hangover from really sharing my story, right? Like really like that's me sharing all the baggage, right? Um, but one of the things that I love and admire about you is that like you had sort of already told your story and and then the universe conspired in some way to make sure that you were then being of service. And it happened twice, right? It happened once with the weight loss. It happened once with the sobriety coaching. And so what gave you the courage to be able to share those stories. And I think you do such an amazing job of like sharing where you are at. And so I'd like for you to give guidance to other people who are like really want to be of service, but are, but are scared to tell their story and are either living in shame or living in fear of other people, not liking them. Um, because for me, I see that that's the biggest place where people get stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think my husband was stuck there longer than I was because as soon as I started talking about it, I am, you know, give me an idea and I want to run with it and make it happen tomorrow and, and then easily get burnt out because of it. He was really skeptical of what it would look like living in a small town. And oh my gosh, are you married to an alcoholic? Does that hurt my reputation? What I would say is when we put it all out there, we're reducing stigma, which makes other people able to raise their hand and tell their stories. If I'm freely talking about alcohol and then you start talking about it too, and then she starts talking about it, well, what can they do to us? How can we be penalized for being human with a human condition? Um, so the more of us that kind of get out there and stand up and say, yeah, me too. I had this problem. I overcame it. Let me show you how to do it too. We can take the shame and guilt out of it, which is what I think gets people stuck in addiction is that they feel like they have to go admit this to somebody and then you're going to be less than or looked down upon, especially alcohol, because we treat alcohol so much differently than we do other drugs. Alcohol is a drug. Um, and so if I have a heroin problem, it's like, oh gosh, we got to get this girl some help. We love her so much. We can't watch her go down this heroin, you know, path. But if I have a problem with alcohol, everyone looks at you and says, Lauren's broken. Lauren is weak. Lauren can't handle it. Lauren, there's something, there's miswiring or it's something wrong with me. And the reason for that is because that enables everyone else to continue consuming their drug of choice without feeling guilty. It helps them stay aligned with what they want to believe about themselves and about their alcohol use. Um, so if more of us stand up, me being one of them, then we can all have better lives because there's, especially women with the wine culture that we already hit on, there are people really suffering. Pair that up with wine culture, 
bringing the kids home. Now we're homeschooling. There's no school with COVID. It took so many people down, it took down mental health and everyone came out of the pandemic with not everyone, but a good many more than we would expect to see in a normal time came out with an addiction. And yeah. whether that's shopping or alcohol or another drug, porn, sex, whatever it is, food. Yeah. 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 Amen to all of it. Like that. Well, it was scary. You know, getting my story out was scary. I, I, I did it on TikTok. I only had like 500 followers at the time. So I was like, let's do this. And I told my story. It took me like 10 minutes because I'm a talker. So I had to do like three different things. Part one, part two, part three. But once I got out, got it all out of me, there was a weight lifted. And it actually enabled me to heal a little bit more because I was no longer hiding, scared in a closet that you would find out this information about me. I was in front of it proactively, like, what are you going to find out about me now that's going to harm me? You can go digging through all of my past and there's nothing in my past that is more socially unacceptable than me having a drinking problem. Yeah. So, there Yeah. It is. And I think, you know, people love people who are bold and out there and are willing to speak their truth. Unless they're hiding something is one of the things that I find, right? Like the people who will give you crap about not drinking at the whatever, at the party, are generally people who are worried about their drinking and are trying to justify it, right? And that's one of the things that I've realized is, you know, there's more power in sharing my story. And even if I polarize, the people who I'm going to lose are not people who I wanted anyway, right? And the people that I, the, I'm going to gain so many more people and be able to help so many other others because we need more normal people like you and me who are not just like, who are successful, creative, intelligent women with families, right? Who have, you know, fall, fall into an addiction and, and it happens. And the more, like to your point, the more we're willing to talk about it, the more we can reduce the stigma and allow other people just like us to get help. So um, this is one thing I ask everybody at the end, uh, kind of the end of our interview is, okay. you know, if you're talking to that person who is, they know they have a problem, right? She, he are on, you know, on the bathroom floor crying in the middle of their dark night of the soul. What's, what advice would you give them? Reach out to someone. There's so many methods, but um, having support. The one thing that makes my coaching a good fit for a lot of people is that most of us where we're this gray area drinking, we're not on that park bench yet, but we could get there eventually because it is a slide. We just haven't slid far enough yet. Um, the problem is that we don't realize that it actually, I never thought I could give up wine. It was my best friend, right? But if we do it the correct way, we can actually come out of this and be better for it. We're not missing her, which was my wine. She was personified, right? I'm actually okay. And even if you don't plan to become a sober coach, let's say you get sober, you don't have to tell your story in order to you know, serve other people, but you telling your story or giving a referral to another resource for someone else can change another life. So you can still be in service of other people, even if like you, Sherry, you're not a sobriety, you're not in the sobriety space for what you do, but you definitely have had an impact on people through your sobriety and through talking about it because you've made it okay to talk about, you've made it okay to seek help. So the first thing is get some support, get really honest with yourself. I actually have a quiz on my website and I know you'll drop the links um, after our, um, you know, in the show notes, but I have a quiz on my website that enables you to um, just check it out and see, do I have a problem with alcohol or do I not? And then I do free consults with people to even see if I would be a good fit for you. Um, because there's different stages, there's gray drinking. And then we have, we do have people that uh, really do need a medical detox, but that's few and far in between. And you're not the person that's still showing up to work every day, nine to five and, and leading a life that's still pretty functional. Um, but the first step is get off the floor and call somebody and forgive yourself because it is your responsibility to take care of this now that you know you're kind of problematic with your behaviors. But this happened to you um, kind of in front of everybody and nobody knew what to do or say because we've just been lied to. So alcohol is the only drug that's legal to purchase if you're over 21 years old that really takes down a lot of people and is highly addictive. We're not told that it's addictive. We're told that only if we abuse it, but the abuse 
happens so slowly. It's like the, the pot of boiling crabs or the, the warm water with the frog. It just keeps getting hotter and hotter and they don't realize that it's getting hot until it's too late and you're boiled. And that's, you know, when you stand up and say, okay, the water's too hot. I'm either going to go all the way down and be dead and shriveled, or I'm going to climb out of the pot now and go get some help. Um, so what I love about sober coaching with me is that it can be anonymous. If you're a person that doesn't have time or needs to Zoom or can't get to meetings on a regular basis, um, AA is also beautiful, um, but it really is preference on which way you want to go about it. My coaching is very um, tailored to each individual because we're all in a different space. Um, I have clients right now who they're like, I don't think people understand I have a problem because I drink from eight in the morning to 11 in the morning. And then I'm great all of the rest of the day. And they've done this mental math. So they can still get a good night's sleep and they can still hold down a job, but nobody's ever understood them because they went to AA and they're like, you don't have a problem. You're drinking from eight to 11 and your life is like beautiful. You don't drink when you're out with your clients. You don't, you know, you're not doing, and they leave feeling like maybe they don't have a problem. So number one, I would say if you're on the bathroom floor and this is not your first time there, it, it's time to get real about like, what do you really want out of life? And what do you, what else do you want alcohol to take from you before you decide to get rid of it? Um, so that would be my advice. I hope I answered your question. That was very long winded. No, it was great. It was great. I appreciate you so much. So if people want to find you, where can they find you? They can find me everywhere. I'm on YouTube as Lauren Hellman. I'm on TikTok, with, which is where I'm most active. Um, and you'll get to see because I do have ADHD, I don't only do sober content. Sometimes I'm just dancing or my kids are dancing or we're just joking around because it's fun. And hey, guess what, guys? We are allowed to have fun in life. Like we're allowed to just do things because it's fun instead of like to earn money or to check something off your list. But I have a fun channel and I do a lot of sober content. Um, so TikTok, Lauren Howman. Um, you can find me on Facebook as Lauren Howman. I'm I'm everywhere as Lauren Howman. And um, you can also find me on howmanhealth.com, which is my website. And that's where that quiz is. And you can also book a consult with me um, to have a conversation. And you can also book with me in my bio from TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. Yeah, I would Let definitely encourage you guys. Yeah, you're everywhere. You are. And you're such... You know, some of it was that you were a wellness coach before you and I met, right? But you you are a, such a great example of someone who can show up really authentically on social media and be entertaining, but also provide great content at the same time. And you, I think that just sort of comes naturally to you, right? For for a lot of my clients, I sort of have to teach them, and I never had to teach you that, right? It was always it was the other stuff, right? You know. Right. The, what are we going to offer and message, you know, a little bit of messaging and some of, some of those things. But um, I love watching your channel because I just think you're such a great example of somebody who's creating a personal brand, but a personal brand that's also being of service to other people. And it's that fine line um, of entertainment, but service that also drives revenue. Right. And so if you guys are looking for somebody to be a good social, uh, social media, you know, hero, somebody to watch. Um, Lauren is a great example of that. So oh, thank you. Yeah. I think that really comes from, that's one of those things that if you can get out there and tell your story, you don't have skeletons in your closet anymore. And you can really show up as authentic because it doesn't matter anymore. And you'll see me sometimes like with bedhead and my favorite sweatshirt on, which I wear 45 times a week. And then sometimes you get lucky and you, you have my hair done and I actually have mascara on today. It's kind of amazing. I know you look fabulous. <laughs> And I, I'm dressed to match you. So I did want to let the listeners know that the red is on purpose for your glasses. And if you want to see us and you're listening to this podcast, um, the all of the podcasts are also on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, which is if you just look for Sherry Sutton marketing mentor, or if you search for bosses with baggage, you should be able to find it as well. So you can see the fabulous Lauren and I in our red. Um, so thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I yes, adore you, you. And thank you so much for being vulnerable and willing to share your story um, with all of us so that we can, you know, destigmatize not only weight loss, but uh, recovery as well. And um, if you guys, again, feel like you might, aren't even sure if you're struggling, right? Check out her quiz. I actually 
that's how my sobriety journey started. I was at home Googling, am I an alcoholic? And I was taking quizzes. And <laughs> they were all coming up yes, by the way. Spoiler oh, alert. For sure. For sure. <laughs> give away the quiz, but the answer is yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Clearly the answer was yes. And then I'll send you, I'll send you my TED talk to hear the rest of the story. But the title of my TED talk is how Facebook saved my life. And so I started with the Google, I headed over to Facebook and, and you know, the rest is history for me, but those quizzes are really, really helpful, right? As somebody who really wasn't sure and went to those, you know, to one of those and yours is really good. Um, it, they are they are so helpful if you're really not sure. So I really encourage you to go check those out. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thanks again, Lauren. Thank you, Sherry. And if you guys enjoyed this podcast, please like, share, tell your friends. If you know somebody who would be a great guest, give me a holler. You can find me everywhere at SherrySutton.com or, you know, any of the social places. Thank you for listening to Bosses with Baggage. We are honored that you chose to spend your precious time with us. I hope that you are feeling inspired to reframe your setbacks into your superpowers so that you can change not only your life, but the life of everyone around you. If you enjoyed today's podcast, and I sure hope you did, please subscribe, rate, and share on your favorite podcast listener. And if you have any ideas for a future guest or you need some help growing your business, I'd love to connect with you. You can find me directly on my website, which is SherrySutton.com, S-H-E-R-R-Y-S-U-T-T-O-N.com. We'll see you next time.